Hello and welcome to the NWR Virtual Healthcare Conference. My name is Matt Wright and we're looking forward to bringing you a range of stories from the private and ASX listed life sciences sector to you over the next couple of days. First up, we have Steve Whedon, the President, CEO and Board Chair of Imracor, listed under the ASX ticker IMR. Imracor has quickly grown to be the first and only company in the world to bring commercially viable and safe products to the catheter ablation market. We'll hear from Steve in a moment, but if anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to type them in using the Q&A function within Zoom. I'll now pass it over to Steve. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this morning. It's, uh, I'm coming to you from a hotel room in London, so I apologize for the, uh, for the background, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn my camera off so we can focus on the, uh, on the presentation I have here today. But first, what I'd just like to say is what, we, what, we, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you who we are, what we're doing at Emrecor, why we're doing it. I'll give you a little bit of overview of the, um, uh, the medicine side of things, uh, why our devices fit uh, uh, where they do in that context, and what we're doing as we move towards the future. First, I want to say that the, uh, what we do at Emrecor is we're addressing uh, interventional medicine, in particular cardiac ablations at first. And cardiac ablation is a technique where a catheter, when your heart is beating irregularly for uh, electrical reasons, a catheter is guided into your heart and selectively burns heart tissue in a way that restores normal heart rhythm, but either by isolating an area on the heart or by blocking that area off from, from other parts of the heart. And these are procedures that have been done for years, uh, decades really, in uh, X-ray fluoroscopy labs augmented with 3D mapping systems and other things to help uh, physicians do those procedures. And that's the market that we're going after. If I go forward here on my slides, you'll see that what we're doing at Imricor is we're transitioning these cardiac ablations into a new kind of lab, away from those conventional X-ray labs, which is shown here on the left, and into what we call an ICMR lab, or an Interventional Cardiac Magnetic Resonance Lab. This lab is very much the same. All the, all the kinds of tools that the doctors use, the, the screens and electrical information from the heart and the visual information from the heart, all the same, except in this case, what they're looking at are X-ray images of the heart. And in our case, what they're looking at is MRI images of the heart. And everyone uh, that plays in this market of EP plays in this space meaning Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Abbott, Johnson & Johnson, they all make devices for the X-ray EP lab. And only Imricor makes devices for an ICMR EP lab, one that houses an MRI system rather than an X-ray system. Otherwise, same tools, um, same procedures, but advantages of MR imaging, no radiation for the patient or the physician, no lead gowns that this, that this doctor's wearing are needed when you're in an ICMR lab. Those are intended to protect you from the X-ray radiation, uh, but very heavy and creates problems for physicians uh, and orthopedic problems for them as they move forward through their career. And the MRI lab, because it houses this standard conventional MRI system, nothing special about that, it can generate additional revenue for the hospital so that when procedures aren't being performed, they can do diagnostic imaging in that same footprint, whereas this lab is only useful for interventions. So in this lab, again, Imricor is the only player. We, can, we capture 100% of the consumable revenue that, that comes from procedures performed in that, and we have no competition here. Moving on. Those questions you might ask yourself are why we would do this and what did we have to do to enable ICMR? Well, why guiding procedures with an MRI in an ICMR lab is an easy question to answer. It's because the heart is invisible to x-rays. So you're looking now at a picture of a patient's heart with uh, one, two, three catheters inside of that heart. And doctors can tell where these catheters are by the electrical signals they get from, from these catheters. But the very thing that they're trying to work on, the thing that they're trying to uh, deliver therapy to of late and create uh, a better cardiac rhythm is invisible to them. When you compare that to the environment that we offer physicians, this is our visualization environment, which we call the North Star 3D mapping system. This is a bit of a video I'll play. In the North Star 3D mapping system, we control the MRI system, meaning we tell it what scans to run and initiate them, and we receive the MRI data from the MR system in real time. And we present that, though, uniquely in three dimensions. You saw the, the plane rotate around. 
because we have that 3D data, we can create these 3D volumes of the heart in a way that is based only on the real data and not on any surrogate of that. And we can do this while we show uh, images, track our catheter, which you see being tracked in the, in the image there, and have live beating hearts uh, alongside that. So we can mix the best of 3D electroanatomical mapping, real soft tissue cardiac imaging of the heart, and catheter um, manipulation and tracking throughout the entire procedure. Another important point is that we use the MRI system itself to track our catheters, not some external patches and so forth. So that means that everything when you start a procedure with our, with our uh, technology is automatically calibrated, automatically registered. What you're looking at is the real stuff, not some surrogate of, of a patient. So the benefits of, of MRI visualization, it's, the first one's pretty simple, right? The doctors can see what they're doing. Every heart is a little bit different than every other heart. And those same differences can create problems when you can't actually see the tissue. And, and so doctors have to work around these problems. They're trained to know what the heart is supposed to look like. And then the typical kinds of things that in that invisible space they might run into. But with MRI, they can see those problems and they can more quickly adapt their techniques and their approaches to how they address the tissue by looking at those images. They can also directly target the problem, meaning we can use MRI imaging and MRI data to analyze the patient's heart, deliver to them uh, an indication of where they should ablate, not just uh, where to move around, but where they should actually ablate and deliver their therapy uh, for each patient, which is again, a very individualized uh, situation. Third thing is, and this is also very important, the doctors can see the end result of their ablation therapy. And this has been the dream of MR, uh, 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 MR interventions for a long time. And now it really is becoming a reality where they can tell the difference between what is a, a lesion today that's durable that will last uh, for years and years, and what is a lesion today that might heal when the patient goes home. And that healing of, of a, an ablation lesion is the type of thing that means the arrhythmia comes back and the patient has to go back for a second or third procedure. And that has long been, like I say, the, the holy grail of, of what we wanna do in MRI. And you know, we're always very careful about what we say is possible, um, but uh, that is possible, and we are delivering that to, to, um, uh, to physicians very soon. The fourth thing is that there's no radiation. I mentioned this earlier, no radiation for patients or medical personnel, uh, which is a nice side benefit, but actually not the reason we do procedures guided by MRI. When you look at all of that together, there's a really compelling value proposition for every stakeholder involved. The patient has the, has the potential for higher success rates uh, with their procedures and faster procedures and no radiation exposure. The doctor gets improved visualization, a faster procedure because they can directly target that, that tissue and better procedures for their patients. In addition, no radiation for them, which is actually more important than no radiation for the patient because while the patient may have one, two, or three of these procedures today, the doctor is in that lab every day and, and there's just no way to stop some radiation exposure that they're going to get. And then they don't have to wear those lead gowns that, that uh, create problems for their knees and ankles over time. The payer, meaning insurance companies or, or the government, depending on where you are, they also benefit from this because if we can do in one procedure, what it takes two or three procedures to do today, and we can do that same procedure for the cost of a single procedure today, then the cost to treat a patient uh, goes down uh, in an overall sense. And it's very costly to have these repeat procedures because not only do you do the procedure twice, but you allow the arrhythmia a chance to continue to progress. And there's data that shows it can be up to four times as much as expensive to do a second, the, the healthcare associated with a second procedure for something like atrial fibrillation. And last, the hospital, because they can get shorter procedures, means that they can do more procedures per day, generate more revenue. They eliminate radiation for their patients, physicians, and staff, and they can generate that additional revenue in that footprint in a way that they can't do in a conventional EP lab. The second question is, how did we do this? What did we have to do to make ICMR work in an EP lab? Well, I didn't invent the idea of, of doing these procedures in MRI. The only thing I invented is the technology that allows us to make devices that are compatible with MRI. If you take a standard um, ablation catheter and put that in MRI, it will heat up into the point where some will melt. It will stick to the side of the magnet because it has magnetic uh, materials in it. 
Uh, and there are lots of, um, of other problems associated with devices and MRI. It's a very difficult problem. Many of the big companies I mentioned tried and were unsuccessful at making devices that were MRI compatible. Lots of little startup companies started, tried, and failed to make MRI compatible equipment. Only Immercore has the patented platform of technology that allows us to make medical devices that are uniquely MRI compatible. And we are the last one to try, frankly, and the only one to succeed. We have many patents that, that um, protect our uh, unique technology, and they're relatively new, meaning they don't start to expire till uh, 2030 is our, when our first one begins to expire. And we've continued to back that patent portfolio up with more and more. And beyond just the patents, we also have a unique expertise in making these devices uh, that we've built over the last 15 years. So I want to show you just a quick video. I'll play this. We are reaching a new era of treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. I started 20 years ago, and we have to rely on fluoroscopy. And now, since a couple of years, we have experience with MRI-guided ablations. And it's completely new. It's a completely new field. Imracor is the first and only company to offer a real-time solution in the ICMR lab. Advantage MREP Recorder Stimulator System provides proven technology that allows the physician to have both the EP recording system and a cardiac stimulator while ablating within the ICMR environment. The Vision MR ablation catheter is specifically engineered to work under real-time MRI guidance. This nine French open irrigated ablation catheter is designed to look feel and function like a traditional ablation catheter. It features a four millimeter open irrigated tip electrode, fiber optic tip temperature sensing, active catheter imaging, and active MR tracking. In the MRI, we have for the first time, the information of the structure of the myocardium, the orientation, it was a completely new experience to treat arrhythmias. MR guidance is the future of cardiac ablations offering improved visualization and reduces the risk of radiation exposure. Now we work eight to 10 years on MRI. And now it's the first time after a long time that we can do it as a routine procedure. That was a big important step for us, for the technology. And I expect the next steps are going, going faster and faster because now we can prove and show that it's simple to go with these procedures, we can manage complications. And I think the community will become bigger. So the, the scientific community, the interest, so the, it, it, it's, it's a perfect new field to work. Now I was playing that, I was actually wondering myself if the audio came through, but there were subtitles nonetheless, so hopefully that, um, that was still an effective uh, communication tool. I have one more procedure video clip. This is very short. I just wanna show you from a real procedure in, uh, this is in the Leipzig Heart Center. It gives you an idea of how, uh, more carefully, of what this looks like for the physician. Here you see our catheter being tracked at the bottom of this uh, image. And as we start to play, you'll see the catheter work up the inferior vena cava and into the right atrium in this particular case. And this is the kind of environment we provide uh, during our procedures. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, this is our EP recording system, the Advantage system, where they get electrical measurements off of the catheter from the heart. And here, Professor Zomer is now putting in a second catheter for this same procedure. And this fast forwards a bit to a part of the procedure where he's actually leaving ablation points uh, on the catheter and now uh, visualizing the, uh, both those points and the electrical data he's getting at those times. And here you see actually at the same time he's doing that, there's some support staff in the control room that are seeing the same information out there and helping him guide the procedure. It's very much like what they do in an x-ray lab, except so the same people, same location, same tools, only these are MR compatible and they get the advantages of that MR imaging.
I want to share with you that you know I started this company in my basement in 2006, and it is a growing global company now. We have offices, research centers, and customers across 12 countries and four continents. We're based currently in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where we have our headquarters, and we have our clean room manufacturing facilities for the catheters. Outside of these clean rooms are actually another manufacturing facility for our electronics. And nearby, in a separate building, we have what's called our ICMR Design Center. Our ICMR Design Center is where all of our engineering happens, our new design of, of electronics and catheter technology. And we also have our own ICMR lab in-house that allows us to do research and preclinical studies there with doctors. It's a way they can come and see what a lab should look like, how to set it up, and even perform uh, surrogate procedures. Now to give you a quick, in the last few minutes here, a quick update on our business and how and what the outlook looks like. This has been our path uh, for a long time now. We started with, uh, there are multiple different types of procedures that we can do, arrhythmias that we can treat it. And as we move into a new environment, we started where many catheters start with atrial flutter, which is a relatively straightforward procedure to do. And that's where we are today. We're commercial in Europe and we are working toward FDA approval. I'll get to that in a moment. But we're commercial in Europe doing atrial flutter ablations guided by MRI. And that builds the platform of, of lab and experience in this new environment to do these growth and expansion plans. The first thing is to grow to new indications, to treat the types of complex arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillation that uh, are really the drivers of, of MR guidance. And our next one is ventricular tachycardia. This is uh, the, the next phase that will grow in Europe. At the same time, we want to expand our geographies, and that's where FDA approval fits in. But not just FDA approval, but also uh, TGA approval, which is in process now, and finally in the final stages of process, uh, and other approvals around the world as we expand our geographies into the Middle East uh, and potentially even Asia. We're looking at uh, uh, then finally addressing the entire market. And that means going after atrial fibrillation, which is, again, along with VT, one of the primary reasons to, to, to drives doctors to do uh, these procedures in MRI. So what are we doing this year? Well, right now we have the, the uh, foundations of our VT trial set in Europe, meaning that the, the tools have been developed. We actually did that through the pandemic, even though hospitals were closed down and they couldn't, we couldn't do the commercialization efforts that we wanted to. We did stick with our plan on developing the devices. And so we have all the tools now ready to move from flutter ablations on the right side of the heart to ventricular tachycardia ablations on the left side of the heart. And our protocol for uh, for doing this VT trial, which we call visible VT or the vision MR ablation of VT has been submitted and approved by the Leipzig Ethics Committee. And the next step is to get uh, the German Federal Institute of Drugs and Medicine, which is called BFARM. That's the competent authority in Germany to get approval from them. And that's an approval process that's happening right now. We just heard from them uh, last week. Uh, we have a couple of months to get data together to resubmit to them. But we are expecting to start this trial in the second quarter. The trial is relatively small. As clinical trials go, it's nothing like a drug trial. For devices, we only have 64 patients, including a six-month follow-up for each patient. And we expect to enroll not just at the Leipzig Heart Center, but at other heart centers around Germany and in the Netherlands and, and potentially other uh, uh, countries as well. The second thing is the FDA trial foundation is being set in the USA. We have received IDE approval from the FDA to start to commence a what we call the visible AFL or the visible uh, atrial flutter uh, clinical trial. That is essentially doing what we've already done in Europe, but doing it in the USA to get this platform of devices in lab established and approved in the US. And then we can follow that very quickly with VT trials in, in the US as well, because now all of the other devices are, are already uh, developed. That study is a 91 patient study. Um, that although we have an, an interim analysis after 76 patients, and if that looks well uh, the way we think it will, we think that um, we may be able to stop short of the 91 patients. I want to keep in mind that when we did this trial in, in uh, Europe, we only uh, treated 34 patients. We had 100% 100 success rate for chronic success, and that uh, is this, the same type of uh, success that we expect, of course, when we repeat that procedure in the US. And so this is what our focus looks like on the year ahead. We are going to continue now relaunching essentially after the pandemic our, our commercial activities. That means activating sites 
uh, that we have agreements with and signed with. We'll continue signing new sites, but we do have a new focus on our commercialization efforts to, to focus on cardiology owned ICMR labs. What we did in the beginning, and those of you who have followed the story for a while, you'll know this, is that we can use a, an MRI system that you have in your hospital now. We can bring our equipment in and we can make an ICMR lab out of that. And many sites, uh, that was the way to get started most quickly. And a good collaboration between radiology and cardiology made that happen. But what we found over the past several months post-pandemic is that despite everybody's best intentions, it's logistically challenging to borrow that time from radiology uh, and, and find the, the right mix to get patients lining up their timelines along, along with uh, when radiation radi uh, radiology slots are available. So we're really focusing on the kinds of labs like you just saw in the video from the Dresden Heart Center or the other clip from the Leipzig Heart Center where the MRI is owned and controlled by cardiology as just another one of their EP labs. And that's the way we're growing now as we move to the future. It takes a bit longer to establish these labs because construction is involved in the purchase of MRI and, and the establishment of, of our equipment and other third-party equipment that we sell to get that lab set up. But that's the best way to move forward. And so that's what we're doing now. And the other two things are the two trials that I mentioned. We're, we're entirely focused on this VT trial and the atrial flutter trial. And this week, uh, actually, maybe I'll stop right there, but I will say really quickly, this week we did a customer summit uh, I'm in London on my way home, actually. We met with some, some uh, customers and research centers here uh, today. But before that, I've been in Germany where we had uh, our second customer summit to have some of the doctors who do our procedures talking to new doctors who would like to adopt this at their hospitals. And it's just been a really great week. We're really excited about the future. And um, yeah, I think maybe that's a good time to just open it up to questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Steve. As you mentioned, we'll move into some Q&A. Um, so the first question I have I've had come through is, is this more a nice to have versus a standard of care? And what is the sell for doctors to adopt this? Yeah, so we're doing something very um, uh, ambitious here. We are, we are trying to, and, and I think we're going to, change the standard of care. So right now what it is, is... Uh, we're doing atrial flutter ablations, which are a, I would say, nice to have, but nobody's doing atrial flutter ablations in the MR because they want to do atrial flutter ablations in the MR. They're doing atrial flutter ablations in this MR environment because there's real value that's been proven for decades of doing atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia ablations in the MR. And so this is really just the birth of a new field, and um, ultimately we think it will be the standard of care. It's our uh, expectation that this it will be the best way to treat arrhythmias, to treat your patients, uh, individualize the treatment for each patient, and make sure that, that you did in one job what today it takes two or three jobs to do. Thanks, Steve. Uh, the next question I've got is, is training surgeons to perform in an MRI setting a hurdle to adoption? You know, you'd think it was, but uh, it, we were very careful to make sure that all the things from the tools, the way they feel and function to the, to the types of information that we provide on our screens to make that look very much like it looks like today in a conventional EP lab so that the learning curve is very straightforward. You saw a couple of pictures throughout the presentation of two doctors standing next to each other. That's actually from the very first week of commercialization just prior to the pandemic when we launched um, this in the Dresden Heart Center. One doctor did one procedure, it went great. So the next doctor did the second procedure while he watched, and then a third doctor did a procedure after that. Everybody had a successful and straightforward procedure. The learn curve is actually quite small. So it's, it's an easy transition for them to make. We do have to, have to train the whole staff about what kinds of things you can bring into an MRI and which kinds of things you can't bring into an MRI. So there is some training involved and there is some benefit to doing procedures very routinely in a way that everyone gets used to this new environment and the types of things that you can do in it. Excellent. Uh, the next question I have is, your IP sounds like it would have significant value to some of the larger players you referred to. Can you talk about any interest or engagement you've had with them? Everybody I talked to, uh, talked about just now knows exactly who we are. I've spoken with them for years and years, and, and they've been um, engaged in following our, our program and our progress all along. Our, our technology is, is so valuable, actually, that it, when we were still a private company, I licensed it three times to implant companies to help make their implants, neurostimulators or pacemakers, 
um, compatible with MRI. And we generated over $13 million in revenue just through those licensings. That's how valuable just the patents alone are for just a couple of small players. So we know who they are, but we also know the value of what we've got and where we're just what we're just about to do. Um, so now is not the right time for us to engage with them in in the types of talks that uh, one might think we'd like to do. But um, certainly we 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 know them well. Very good. Uh, and another question is: When do you expect the barriers to be removed in terms of total adoption? Is it upon approval of VT? And can you run us through how you look at that? I think it's a little bit, it's not so, uh, it's not like flipping a switch, but there are a couple of big inflection points. The first inflection point is not going to be the approval of VT. It's going to be the first time we do a VT procedure. And we have doctors talking about that, showing videos of it and, and telling the world that, hey, look, we've actually done now what has been promised for years and something we've dreamed about, uh, doctors themselves, um, since 95, when this whole concept was actually conceived to do these procedures in MRI. That's going to be the first big inflection point. Another big inflection point is going to be FDA approval. And, and the third will then be uh, some really cool atrial fibrillation pilot studies that we're doing this year, um, which are relatively new, but something that we're pretty excited about. By the end of the year, we expect to have good data that proves something everyone has suspected, which is that with MRI, you can say that this lesion is going to last forever and this lesion is not going to last forever. And you can fill that gap in, in the first procedure. We're really excited about that work. And it's a study we've been doing for a while with one of our, our clinical partners, and uh, we're excited about how the data is working out. Right. Thanks very much for your time today, Steve. That's uh, was all we've got time for. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, next up in the conference, we have Radio Farm Theranostics uh, at 9am Eastern Time. Uh, but thanks again, Steve. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.